G'day guys, today I interviewed Michael Croy who went undefeated at a super major event with a truly unique and inspiring world leaders list that didn't contain the standard meta units. So it's absolutely inspiring to see the faction performing with a diverse array of units. We talk about his list in detail, as well as a detailed breakdown of every matchup, what worked and what didn't work. So with that being said, let's get stuck into the video. Look for the blood gun. Blog for the Blood God exclusive high quality dice. Blog for the Blood God exclusive high quality dice. Blog for the Blood God exclusive high quality dice. Hi, I'm Dean Simbeck, President and CEO of Blog for the Blood God's exclusive high quality dice warehouse and emporium. Due to a shipping error, I'm currently overstocked with Blog for the Blood God exclusive high quality dice, and I'm passing the savings on to you. Roll nine inch charges, pass invulnerable saves, roll high for damage, and score lots of hits. Check out the links in the description of this video to pick up your set today. Alrighty, Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for taking the time to come on. I know it's quite late there at the moment, so I really do appreciate you coming on to talk to us about your fantastic results recently with the World Eaters. So uh, I guess the best place to kick it off is maybe just uh, introduce yourself to uh, my listeners and then uh, just walk us through the event that you attended and the, the format, those sorts of things, so that we can uh, have some context and then we'll dive into your list in detail and the uh, rounds and the matchups that you played. Sure thing. Uh, so I recently played a major, 108 players, I think, when the, the event started, but I think for uh, a few of them dropped during the tournament, just as they do. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was, uh, had an amazing time. Aegis Games uh, here in Washington State put it on, and they did a really good job. It was their first uh, major tournament, and I couldn't have been happier. Yep, awesome. Uh, was it eight rounds? What was the terrain like? We want to break down a little uh, bit sort of detail. It was uh, six rounds, uh, and the terrain was uh, GW standard layout ITC format. Yep. So pretty good. Uh, BCP app was the clocker that did all of the uh, uh, pairings and ranks. So pretty standard format, I think. Yep. Yep, sounds good. Um, and the re one of the main reasons that I wanted you on, because obviously you went undefeated, that's correct, yeah? That is correct, yeah. Um, and I remember we were just, I was looking at running World Eaters for an upcoming Teams event. So part of my process when I'm doing that is to look at recent Teams events and recent major events around the world to see what other people are doing in terms of World Eaters, to see if there's any inspiration I can glean from that. And also see how well leaders are performing, what they're beating, what they're losing into, so that I can decide if it's an appropriate list for me to field in that team's environment. And when I came sure. across your list, my jaw hit the floor. I was like, what is this? This list is so hard <laughs> to field. This is so unique, yeah. so interesting, and clearly very powerful. Like, you've got some amazing results with it. So I was like, anytime you have somebody that's going to break the norm like that and come up with something creative and innovative and unique... I have to have the conversation with them. So, yeah. Right. Uh, do you want to maybe run us through this uh, esoteric world leaders list? Sort of what's in the list? Definitely. And then maybe some uh, points on like what inspired you to bring these units and, and what the sort of plan behind that list construction was. Sure. Uh, so the list is Angron, Demon Prince with Wings with the Glaive. And we got uh, Jug Lord with Favorite of Corn, Unit of Jackals, two units of Spawn. Two units of three eight bound, three Mahler fiends, two forge fiends with yep. plasmas. Just really, it. I find that the eight bound are a little too frail, and I tend to throw them away when I play with them. Yep. Uh, so they just end up killing something and then dying for me. So I wanted something with a little more durability. So I leaned into the vehicles a little more heavily, and Mahler fiends can put out a decent amount of threat saturation. If you take those along with Angron and a Demon Prince, and you've got still have eight bound in there, it's a lot of fast moving threats that have to be dealt with, and you can kind of use them interchangeably by like, oh my opponent is weak to vehicles, I'll send the Mauler Fiends in first. Oh my opponent's not so weak to vehicles, I guess I'll throw the eight bound to soften things up. Eight bound will die, spawn will die. But the spawn are surprisingly durable as well, and a lot of people get caught off guard by how durable they are with that four-up feel no pain. Yeah. 
and with how many attacks they can throw out. You get a good roll with them. You're throwing out 16, 17 attacks with them on a charge, and it's like sustained hits or lethal hits going into Chaos Knights is what I used, and I got like two spawn cracked a knight in one round. Wow. That's very impressive. So the spawn is something that I've been... Every time I look at it, I'm like, I should bring spawn, but then I'm like, I kind of feel like just paying the extra points and making them jackals so that they stick your objectives and so that they can string out a right. large area. But then I keep looking at that spawn data sheet and thinking, I mean, they have the capacity to do that damage if you roll hot. So uh, it's right. a really good but that's to their skill. looking for point. luck. If, even if they don't do it every time, if they have the capacity to pop a knight, that's fantastic. Right. I mean, like... It, it is only minus one, but that damage too is really juicy. Yeah. Especially going into things like blade, Knights. How did he, go? Uh, he actually did okay. He's not um, he's not what, what people would really use for like a big beat stick. He's a utility piece. He, he most of the time was left in the back of my zone to defend against, you know, possible deep strikes yep. or reserve moves or anybody trying to run into the backfield, getting around the Mahler fiends, getting around the spawn and the eight bound and that kind of stuff. So he was my counter punch unit for the backfield. And honestly, against the sisters, he did absolutely phenomenally tanked a full unit of 10 with Celestine of the Zephyrim, yep. uh, dropped him to like four wounds. And in the clap back with sustained hits on, he wiped out all but one of the Zephyrim. Uh, and then the next turn, he left combat, and a Forge Fiend came around the corner and blasted the rest of the squad to pieces. Wow. So this opponent's thrown Celestine and Zephyrim in and has actually achieved effectively nothing. <laughs> That's yep. fantastic. He tried, yeah, he tried to go for like my backfield objectives for capture enemy outpost, and the Demon Prince tanked it, and then he just lost the whole squad. Yeah. It was, it was incredible. But yeah, he also plays pretty well into like some harder targets, too, like... Custodes, uh, in my final match, I played against Custodes, and a unit of two Alaris Custodians charged him, and he managed to kill one of them in the clapback and didn't die himself. Yep. And then the Jackals uh, came around the corner and actually managed to kill the last one. Wow, Jackals to the took wound. down a Custodian. That's going to make the yeah. Emperor a bit embarrassed. <laughs> right. Well, again, I mean, lethal hits. Yep. All right, so so that's the list. I really, really like the list. Uh, the The... Mauler Fiends, I actually was running them before they got the points um, buff mm -hmm. in, the in the previous uh, you know, points update. Uh, and yeah. I, they were some of the MVPs. I really, really enjoyed them. So I think terrain permitting, the only problem with them is they can struggle to navigate terrain. It's hard to move uh, them around, yeah. But yeah, if you're playing in a tournament that has the GW layouts, I think that's fine for Mauler Fiends. There's plenty of channels that they can go through. And right. when your target has taken damage, they hit as hard as a carnivore but they're tougher than yep. a carnivore because they've got potentially six up feel no pain and, and the five up feel uh, and they can uh, in one of all times they can do all kinds of really cool stuff they can stick in objective when yep. they die so yep. they sort of fill the similar kind of role they're really really cool yeah no I'm, i love Mahler fiends uh i was playing them in ninth edition as well I, I went to a rtt and took uh two of them that time and went undefeated in that as well, but it was only three rounds, and I still ended up getting second place. Yeah, yeah, that's nice. They're tons of fun. The, um, how did the Forge Fiends feel? Like, we'll, we'll go into detail about who you played and what worked and didn't work they in those games. They were probably the weak link. They were the weak link. They, they did, I think so. They, they did fine. Uh, I took them mostly to tech into uh, Custodes, because yeah. uh, the three wound wardens, they're either going to force the Custodes player to either use his 4 of low pain on the Wardens, and then you can charge him with a, a Mauler Fiend, and he no longer has that 4 of low pain. Yeah. Or, he's not going to use it, and every failed save is a dead Warden. Yeah, absolutely. And every dead Warden counts. Yeah. Because he's not going to have too many of them. He's got 15 max. Yeah, yeah. I definitely think that the Forge Fiends are a really good answer to the Custodies, even though they don't necessarily, like, they're not just going to delete an entire Custody unit. Like you oh, said, no, no. being able to force them to use their 4 up Feel No Pain outside of your combat, and then being able to send in Angron or a Mauler Fiend or, you know, even 8 Bound and going in and doing that damage without the Feel right. No Pain, those, those um, Wardens just fall over a lot faster. So Exactly. Yeah. 
Yeah, and they are they are the big scary. The did you did you uh did you find Angron was he of high value? Was he doing what Angron does best and and popping things or? She does, but again, he's not uh he's not a trade piece in my opinion. I I usually use him pretty reservedly. So yeah. like usually sending him by like turn three, turn four to try to mop up the other things. Um, usually what happens is the eight bound go in first with the spawn because they move so quickly. And either the spawn are going to perform center actions, you know, like cleanse. And yeah. uh, we, we, one of the missions was the ritual. So I had a unit of spawn do the ritual on my turn. And um, I drew cleanse that turn as well. So the other unit when they cleansed. So. Yeah, no, that's cool. There. Um, yeah. All right, so well now that we've we've sort of covered off the list, and we'll go into each one of those units in a little bit more detail, I think, as we talk through the different matchups that you played. So, uh, sure. do you want to just run us through round by round who you, what faction you versed, uh, whether or not you took tactical or fixed secondaries, and then maybe just okay. a couple of highlights from each game. Warhammer community suffers from some of the most prohibitively expensive essentials in the world, especially Australian content creators. Every single day, Dean wants to create content, but he can't. Suffering from old, worn-out brushes, expensive model kits, and costly software and equipment, he can't endure much longer. Just look at this dirty paint water. Would you drink this? Would you let your child? Even a small monthly donation can help provide Dean with clean paint water, basic tools for survival, and access to life-saving information and education. So please, follow the links in the description below and find out how you can sponsor a mad cunt like Dean today and end the suffering. Suffering that is cruel, unsustainable, and your fault. Yeah, let me uh, look through here real quick. Um, so yeah, first round, I got paired into Blood Angels, uh, Flesh Terrors, using the Sons of Sanguinius detachment. Um, and this was a really bad matchup for him because he was running almost entirely infantry. Yeah. Uh, so it was like, you know, Assault Intercessors, Jump Intercessors, uh, Death Company with Jump Packs, and then two Ball Predators. Okay, yep. And the Ball Predators are great, against infantry, but if I'm throwing a Mauler Fiend at you, you're going to plink four, maybe five wounds off of it. Yeah. And that's not going to, it's not going to bracket. It's still going to hit you, and it's going to just crash can that Ball Predator. Yeah. No problem. Yeah, and then even those infantry units, no, not a single infantry unit will be able to put down a Mauler Fiend, which means he's going to have to throw in two. Right. Which means he fights with yep. one, and then I assume you CP interrupt and then smack interrupt before it fights. Right. Uh, I uh, ended up going second that game, and he uh, took the first turn and moved up, and he moved a little too close, yeah. and I got advance and charge, so I mean, that was pretty much game on turn one. Yeah. Um, That's one of my Angron favorite got into a... leaders is I often find that if your opponent is caught slipping, like by moving a little bit too mm -hmm. close, it can often be just game over turn one. Like, you just go, cool, I get my right. first turn, I kill two-thirds of your army or, you know, half of your army. Right, and exactly. And now you just lose. Not many armies have the capacity to just absolutely front-load damage like that. So much fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then that, that was it. It was like Angron went into a unit of Blade Guard with a, uh, what is that, ju Justiciar? Judiciar, yeah. Yep. Yeah, the fight, fight first guy. Uh, but I had hit the other side of it with a unit of Spawn, so I forced him to fight into the Spawn with, like, half the squad. So yeah. he was only putting half the attacks into Angron. Yeah. And it was like, all right, well, pick up all of them. Yeah. <laughs> That's the way. All right. And then so the spawn were able to consolidate in. Easy yeah. round one for you, a really strong mm -hmm. one. Uh, did you take tactical yeah. or fixed objectives for that one? I took tactical. I took tactical in all of my matches. Yeah. Okay, cool. I, I often do the uh, same. There was a couple of matches that I was, uh, like, possible matches. Uh, once I started getting higher up in ranking that I was like, okay, if I go into, like, this particular Necron player or this particular guy, I would take fixed. Um, but that had never happened. Yep. So tactical it was. Yep. Uh, round two, I got paired into Sisters of Battle. Okay. Uh, and I got first turn. It was... Uh, what was it? 
Crucible of Battle, I think. What sort the of deployment? Sisters of Battle were we talking here? Because there's a few different archetypes that sisters tend to run. Uh, so he was running... Or was it more combat-based? Uh, lots of objective-based things. So okay. he had like two units of Seraphim, the big block of Zephyrim with Celestine, Mormon, Val, and her Paragons, yep. like three units of uh, Battle Sisters, Castigators, Im uh, Exorcist, Immolator, like all that stuff. Um, Any Arcos but because of the deployment, nope, no Arcos. Oh, yeah. He had no, no good Arcos? screening units. No. No. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. No. No. No good screening units. Nothing like super crazy. And uh, I got first turn that time. Got plus two to move and advance and charge. And again, that was game score ended a hundred to eighteen. Wow! <laughs> Put him in the dirt. Yeah. No. It was. It was really bad. I like. I was like. I'm. I'm sorry. Like I, this is a tournament. Yeah. I'm playing for placing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes you got to do what you got to do. As long as you do it with a smile on your face and you're respectful, I don't think the score right. necessarily reflects poor sportsmanship. Like, you can have a lot of fun right. while doing it. As long as it's fun for them, then it's cool. Well, and that's the thing. And like, like a lot of things. Like, oh yeah, if you if you go over here, like take this objective from me, or like you can start a cleanse here and do the ritual with another unit, and you get your objective and you get points for that so we tried to get him as many points as possible but like after the first turn we knew the outcome of the game yeah sometimes once you've done that alpha strike damage it can be really hard to claw back those points so right yeah understandable that's uh unfortunate for the sisters player but uh you know it is what it is uh what about round right. three how did that look for you round three i went into necrons and yeah. that was I, I looked at his list and I was like, "Okay, here's my first loss of the of the weekend." Yeah, like which, I which just immediately was like, was it? "Did he have like the monolith with the teleporting and the the immortals and the Katana? no no monolith? Uh, he what had did two he have, Katani, like, he had the Void Dragon and the Nightbringer, um, two units of three wraiths, two units of three scarabs, two units of six uh, destroyers, like the regular ones, yep. with a lord in each unit." Uh, of course, using the Hypercrypt Legion because it's the best for mobility and shenanigans. Uh, unit of Immortals with Tesla and a... I don't remember what the name of the character is, but it lets him shoot and then move again. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it, that match was a hard match. Yeah. How did you do uh, and. Time? I feel like that would have been quite challenging for you, yeah? Poorly. I've never fought them before, so I was like, okay, I don't really know what to do. I know that they have a 4-up in bull. I know they have damage. I know they have a 5-up in pain. But reliably, I should be able to kill one, right? Yeah. The answer is no. Yeah. <laughs> don't believe that. <laughs> and I also made the mistake, I didn't realize that the Void Dragon has anti-vehicle 2-up. Yeah. So I threw a Mauler Fiend at the Void Dragon, did yeah. Tank Shock, did like the six mortal wounds to it. And then he's like, all right, well I take three of them. And I'm like, all right, well I fight and I do like, I don't know. I think I did like six more wounds to it or something like that total, which isn't bad, but it's still alive and it doesn't bracket and it hits on twos wounds on twos. Yeah. And I got some lucky rolls and I was left on one wound. Oh, wow. Very lucky. Yeah, I uh, kept him alive for just that. that. Dragons and absolutely not. He's oh yeah, not just man. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, and then he came for me in the next round and uh, charged the demon prince on the center objective, killed the demon prince. Demon prince fought in death, killed the knight, killed the void dragon, <laughs> and stickied the objective. Nice. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was like all right. Well, fight on death, and I sticky, so it's still mine. And he's like, oh, yeah, oh no. And I think that was like the turning point because at that point it was like he was the last real big nasty. The Nightbringer was still around, but he was like in the backfield. And I just kept throwing like, you know, a unit of eight bounder, a unit of spawn at him to keep him from uh, moving up in my turn yeah. and being able to deep strike somewhere else. And he got into my backfield, but he never got captured in the outpost as one of his tacticals. So yeah. it didn't matter that he controlled my backfield objective. And it was the uh, the one where you only score two points for holding your own and five for holding the ones in no man's. Yeah. And uh, I went second that time again. And in the last round, I got, um, what was it? I think it was Capture Enemy Outpost. But I got 
hold more, hold one, hold more, kill one, kill more, and I had seven points on primary yep. and managed to get a 90 to 86 win, That's like nice. in the last turn, just just barely squeaked by. So very, very close game. Extremely close game. And then, uh, you that was that was the end of close games. They can be some of the most satisfying, right? Like it's oh, it's and it was a ton of fun too. To somebody, but right when you have that game where it's like the entire game is on a razor's edge, and you're like, I'm ahead mm-hmm. by two points this turn. The next turn, he's ahead by two points, and you you're sort of tracking right. that throughout the round, and then it finally comes down to that last turn, and you pull off some magic. That's always so rewarding. Yeah, and that was that was the end of day one. Day two, going into the my first. Like ranked up games, I came up against uh, a Chaos Knights player, yep. which is another one of those ones that I'm like, this is going to be a tough game. Yeah, and um, it was those carnivores. He had like four carnivores, like three or four brigands, a stalker, and he had um, two units of ten blue horrors and th- four units of nurglings. Wow! So, so just screens for days. Yeah. I could not get through the demons turn one, and he just like put them nine inches right outside my zone in a big long line, so I couldn't go anywhere. Yeah, but he definitely overestimated how good a six up field no pain is. Yep, and he put a bunch of shots into a forge fiend with uh, two brigands, like like full shots into one forge fiend with two brigands. Failed to kill it, failed to bracket it, and in response, the uh, Forge Fiend shot back, picked up one of the knights. Yeah. It was like, all right, well, here's three flat damage. Well, you failed four of your saves out of the eight shots that I got? Cool. Yeah. In my experience, versing Chaos Knights with the World Eaters, it all hinges on whether or not you're able to get Angron to hit two knights at once. If they put their knights Mm -hmm. close enough together that you're able to put Angron in the middle and hit both, that's generally what's required to win the, the Chaos Knights matchup. Exactly. Uh, he will pretty reliably send two knights to space. Like, he's pretty good. So oh, yeah, did you manage absolutely. to pull that off, or was your opponent smart enough to sort of I actually didn't, out? no. Uh, he, he spread out quite a bit. Uh, but what happened was he charged the Demon Prince with a carnivore and whiffed. Yeah. Demon Prince picked up the carnivore, next turn picked up another carnivore, and then got shot down, but he had to focus it down with, like, three other knights yeah. in order to kill it. So he was like, all right, well, that's all my shooting for the turn. And I'm like, cool, I still have two Mahler Fiends, two Forge Fiends, and Angron left. Yeah. And they're all midfield at this point, pushing you into your backfield. Yeah, All I your chaff's gone. In that game, the, the taking out the carnivores first is, is highest priority. Imperative, because, absolute yeah, imperative. The, those, um, those brigands, they got two really high-quality shots. And the rest of their shots aren't really that consequential. Whereas mm-hmm. the carnivals, when they charge, mm-hmm. they have six high quality attacks. So they're literally three times as effective as a, as a brigand. So right. being able to just go, cool, where right. are the carnivals? Where are they going to be? And what do I need to do to take them out before they can take me out? So it sounds like you managed to pull that off pretty well with the Demon Prince surviving and then flipping two. Very, very good. Yep. Uh, and then last turn of the game got me 62 to 61. Oh, wow, so another uh, one, a one point win. Yeah, yeah. Going into round five, uh, I faced off against Grey Knights. I had no idea what Grey Knights do besides being able to teleport all over the board. Yeah. Um, my opponent got first turn, luckily for me, because uh, otherwise I think that game would have gone very differently. Yeah, what was in his uh, list? Did he but, have the, the Dread Knights, or did he have lots of Terminators and Paladins? What was the sort of archetype he built around uh, no, it was uh, three Dread Knights, yep. um, Castle and Crow, and a unit of ten Purifiers yep. in a Land Raider Redeemer, of all things. Interesting. Yeah, it was a kind of a cool choice. Um, and then it was like Interceptors and three Librarians by themselves just running around blasting stuff with brain bullets. Yep. Um, but because he got first turn, he had to move out into like the open spaces and try to get points. And Angron went in first, killed the Land Raider Redeemer in, in one go and like easily. Yep. Uh, Mollerfiend managed to get in first turn as well, uh, killed a killed killed a Dread Knight, 
turn one. Oh, wow. Uh, and then got stuck in with a squad of um, interceptors, but couldn't fight back. Yep. Of course, Angron died the next turn to the three librarians just blasting him with rain bullets. Uh, but he came back turn four yep. after the rest of my army had picked up a bunch more stuff on my opponent's side of the field. Uh, and we were playing, um, what was it, Hidden Supplies, the one where the uh, objectives disappear yep. throughout the game. Uh, so I basically just had a unit of 8-bound in the backfield in No Man's Land on the second objective. Not the one that stays all the way through the game, but the one that doesn't leave yep. on turn 4. And I just kept them there, racking up points and focusing his attention elsewhere on the board uh, with a lot of pressure and just forcing him to focus on other things. And then turn four brought Angron back in, uh, rapid ingressed him in my opponent's turn, yep. moved him on my turn, took the objective that was going to be for 15, and that was game. Yep. That's one of my favorite and, and things score. in the world to do, is when you when you bring Angron back, but you had second turn, so you're able to bring yeah. him back and then immediately rapid ingress him and then send him in straight away. Feels yep. so good. Yeah, that was a 83 to 39 victory for that one. Nice, solid win. Yeah. And then my final game was into an amazing Custodes player, uh, James Lee. Incredible, incredible opponent. Just a wonderful human being. Yep. Um, super easy going. Really a lot of fun to play. Uh, he when was you running table game. The last of round of the event, and you get to play into an just, absolute legend. That's the best feeling ever. Oh yeah, and he's like just not sweaty, like yep. not emotionless. Like he really wants to be part of the game. Yeah. I don't know. It was a, it was a great time. Uh, he got first turn. Um, moved everything closer. I got a couple of good early turn charges with 8-bound and spawn and forced him to use those feel no pains and like use his CP to fight first on certain objectives and things like that. And, um, but it it really was just a back and forth just slug fest. Yeah. Over and over and over again over the center objectives. It was incredible. Uh, a couple of like whiffs on both of our parts and uh he decided not to use the feel no pain when he failed a nine inch charge with Prajan valoris and his unit of warden and uh i made him pay for that by dumping nine shots from a forge fiend into it plus the six or plus the uh three other shots for a blast yeah because it was five so it was 12 shots firing into him and he's like nope i'm not gonna use the feel of pain and i'm like all right well here's 12 shots and uh like eight of them hit seven of them wounded failed like three saves killed three of the wardens off the bat Oof. and uh i mean he got the charge next turn but he went into a unit of uh eight bound and whiffed with a bunch of the custodies and ended up killing one eight bound and putting like five wounds on an unwounded Mauler fiend that he threw Trajan into. And in the, the swing back, uh, A, I fought on death with the uh, custodian that died. And then the champion that was left ended up picking up the last two remaining wardens. Yep. And the Mauler fiend almost killed Trajan. Wow. But then Trajan just kept whiffing on his turn. Like He was like, all right, I'm going to use my two up invulnerable save this combat. So I did no damage that turn. But the following turn, I just picked him up because he just couldn't kill the Mauler Fiend. Yeah. Did you... Because uh, he was wounding on fives. The, um, did you use the neg one damage strat much in that game? I find that when you're versing the custodians, Not that's once. one thing that really slows them down. I I rarely have the CP to use that stratagem because I'm almost always using Tank Shock every yeah. single turn. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> with, with those big Mauler Fiends, the Tank Shock is fantastic. Yeah. It's It's... Almost a guaranteed six mortals every single time. Yeah. Like I was, I was getting routinely twenty to thirty mortals per game. Yeah. Sounds good, man. So, uh, what was the score in that that final game? Do you remember? Uh, that final game was uh, eighty nine to eighty five. Wow! So a really close game as well. Yeah. Again, came down to the last turn. I was behind, uh, and I got deploy teleport homers and capture enemy outpost, and uh, Big Ron went and did that, both of those. Yeah, he's a capture any outpost machine. He's so good at it. Oh, so, yeah. Unless they have multiple units on that objective. If they only have one, he's going to hit it, he's going to kill it, he's going to take it. Oh, yeah. One other thing I'd like to say is that the uh, the Lord on Juggernaut is an absolutely fantastic tech piece 
for things like deploy teleport homer behind enemy lines, all that stuff. You hold them in reserve, wait till turn three, drop them in anywhere in your opponent's deployment zone and just run wild. Yeah, yeah, he's really good like that because his relic. Did you give him the favorite of corn relic or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. so that that works even when he's off the table. So you can keep exactly him, you can keep him in reserves and they can't deal with they can't stop you from having access to that relic. And then you just bring him on. Sometimes you'll like rapid ingress him on that turn three, or you'll just bring him on in their deployment zone. Do your teleport homers. Do your behind enemy lines. And then you don't really care if he dies after that. He's just scored you a ton. Right. Of points. Exactly. Like oh yeah. I got a bunch of points off of him. He yeah. might, you know, kill like some chaff units. He's not going to take down a full squad of ten marines or anything by himself, but he might kill like five, yeah, so four or five. Surprisingly tough as well. Like with the two up save, mm -hmm. four up invulnerable save. The amount of times, yeah. like if people want to kill him, they can't just put bolters into him. Like they actually have to put something yeah. substantial into him. And even like I've had, I've had games where he's taken three brigands worth of shooting because he just tanks it all on the four oh, yeah. invulnerable save. You know, one goes yeah. through and it's like, cool, well, they do D6 damage to him and they do four damage to him and it's like, cool, six up, feel no pain, pass a couple of those. Like, it takes right. several successful wounds to kill him. And they don't want to put all that bullets into him because he's not a threat to them. But at the same yeah. time, if they do damage to him, <laughs> he's going to be running around scoring all your secondaries for you. So yeah, exactly. He's an absolute ripper of a unit. I'm a big fan of the... Um, the juggernaut lord even even yeah, and he's the fast too corn, i still think he's an absolute must have he's so good yeah absolutely i agree um so yeah and that was that was my uh my wonderful weekend went undefeated i'm assuming given that there was over 100 players in six round there was multiple undefeated players two two and, and uh, did, so just, did you come first or did your the other guy pip you out for score i came in second yeah you, you beat me with score yeah uh, but, but he he deserved it like he played i watched uh, a couple of his games after because a lot of my games were so fast i like watched a couple of his his games that i was like this guy is an incredible general, and I honestly was extremely nervous if I had to be matched into him. I what like faction was, was he almost in? Necrons. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And he was running like two 20 man bricks of Warriors, uh, Illuminor Zeris, uh, your Transcendent, Nightbringer, Void Dragon, Monolith. Um, I think he had like like two or three individual destroyers or heavy destroyers. Yep. Um, wraiths, scarab swarms, all that good stuff. Just, yep. ugh. Yeah, I, the, yeah, I watched the, him play the against... The is a matchup that we, we very rarely want. <laughs> you don't want to see it, especially yeah. when it's piloted by a master general where they you know they know exactly mm -hmm. what they need to do. It can be very yeah. good for us. Uh, so what were yeah, the was... ways on the, on the list itself? Do you feel like it functioned the way you had hoped? Is there things that you might change for a future event? Like if you were to attend a similar event in your the coming weeks, would you change much? What's your thoughts there? I don't I don't think I would change much. I like the Forge Fiends. I like having a little bit of shooting, uh, and it does add a little more uh, long-range pressure yep. to people. And against those unfavorable like Custodes matchups, it's really a good tech piece and i'll spend 145 points for that no problem yeah it's either that or adding in a carnivore instead and a carnivore just does what a muller fiend does yeah yeah not fair um so yeah that's that's a really interesting list and I, i'm really excited to sort of talk about this because it's so far from what everybody else on the internet is talking about it just shows <laughs> the depth of our faction like a lot of people seem to think that world leaders are very one-dimensional and there's only really one way to play them, but you've demonstrated that that's clearly untrue. So, yeah, that's, that's really right. good. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm really excited about it, and I really enjoy the list. It has a lot of durability, and as long as you pilot it smartly and you're not throwing away things and making bad trades, it does have the potential to do a lot of work. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Did you find with the, um, with the Maul of Fiends... 
that people were blocking your movement much or, or were people unable to sort of pull that trick off? Um, some of them were. I didn't really face a whole lot of screening armies. Yeah. If I were to come up against, like, I don't know, uh, like Ad Mech or something, I'm sure they would have a whole lot of bodies to throw yeah. at me. Yeah. Or, like, a horde orc army would be able to screen out pretty effectively. Uh, but I didn't really run into a whole lot of those lists. And like coming against Grey Knights and Custodes and Chaos Knights, there's not really a whole lot of points left over for screens. Yeah, correct. And if they try to move block you with their unit of wardens, it's like, yeah, cool. I wanted to charge that anyway. So I'm, um, you know. Yeah, I, I was. I wanted to get stuck in there anyway. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, how were you guys using the um, the the GW rules for charging things that are on the other side of a wall? What was the the rules for that at this event? Uh, it never really came up. So um, one of the challenges that I've seen is that if people deploy themselves just just outside of one inch of the wall, then you have to go all the way around with your Mauler Fiends in order to mm -hmm. and, and get the, the target. I'm assuming the rule was in effect because a lot of people were like, I'm just outside of an inch of the wall. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm not charging you with the Mauler Fiends. I'm charging you with Spawn or 8-Bound. Yeah. And they'll go straight through the wall. Yeah, no, fair enough, fair enough. Um, all right, I guess uh, probably a good place to wrap this out because I know people are going to ask this in the comments section, so we might as well get it out here now, is what are your thoughts on our upcoming balanced data slate for World Eaters? Do you think there's anything that should go up, should go down, should rules that should be tweaked? Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about a potential future World Eaters codex because people always ask that, so let's get it out here. Right. So for, for balanced data slates, I think... Angron should go down slightly because he was pointed at the point where he was going to be being resurrected, you know, two, maybe even three times per game. Yep. And now you're really hard pressed to get him out just once, unless you're putting a lot of points into, you know, your Lord of Skulls and like a bunch of Berserkers, which are also overcosted. Yeah. So, like, Berserkers dropping, I don't know, 10 points or so seems about right. Yep. I know some people are yelling for, like, 15 points, but I think 15 might be a little too much um, yep. to drop them. I think 10 points is about right for them. Um, for Codexes, I'm hoping that we get a couple of different detachments. It'd be really cool to get a Brazen Beast detachment, uh, as you've seen my list. <laughs> yeah, I think I think we'll, we'll get a few detachments. My concern, I guess, with the Codex release is that the detachments we get are going to be carbon copies of existing detachments in other factions. Right. Is we've seen with the Necron Codex, we've seen with, you know, the various codexes that have come out that a lot of the detachments right. are just, you know, it's like the Chaos Demons detachment, but it's for, you know, this faction, or it's like the Grey Knights detachment, but it's... Yeah, Grey exactly. Knights. They're kind of more or less the same. Um, and especially with, uh, El like, World Leaders being, like, their own flavor, like, yeah. they really need something that, that doesn't feel identical to something else. Right. Like, you can't just copy and paste the yeah. Blood Angels rules and strats for that. Like, I kept thinking about, like, what would be a cool, like, strat for a World Leaders army, and it would be, like, you know, like, Cloud of Blood or something like that, instead of, like, Cloud of Flies. You could do, like, like the Nurgle thing, where you give, like, just a bloody aura yeah. mist thing that gives cover and stealth within six inches. Yeah, yeah, that'd be cool. Of, um, of like a specific what about, vehicle. Um, what about uh, model releases? Is there any is there any particular unit that you would like to see the world eaters get in a new codex? As with everybody, I would love to see juggernauts with berserkers on them. Yep. Like the, it just would be so cool to have yeah, an army of I nothing but jugs just going at somebody. That's going to happen. Given that we've got a character mm -hmm. riding a juggernaut already, we've got two data sheets that are a character riding a juggernaut. They're clearly leaning into it. You know, I don't right. see any reason that we won't see that. I guess my concern with that, and I, 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 don't get me wrong, I think it would be amazing and I would love to see it from a hobbyist and a modeling perspective. My concern is how would they make them significantly different to 8-bound? You know, Thund Thunderwolves. They're going to be a fast-moving unit that hits hard in combat and is relatively right. tough. So one of them will be mounted, of course, which means it won't be able to move through walls and stuff. But outside yep. of that, it's, it's kind of hard to envision a substantial difference to the units? What? How would you see mm -hmm. them out? I'm not really sure on that one. I think uh, making 8-bound more Terminator-esque instead of, like, fast-moving. Like, you could still make them fast-moving uh, 
give them a little more durability and a little less punch. Yeah. Uh, and then give the the punch to the faster moving, harder hitting berserkers on jugs. Because yeah. I mean, they're going to have a million attacks. Like you give them basically a power sword and the horn. You're talking like like eight nine attacks per model. Yeah. Yeah, I like to. I would like to see uh, exalted eight bound go up to three damage with their chain fists. Absolutely. Regular eight bound be two damage with their eviscerators, and then the juggernaut guys have like a berserker profile. So AP one damage maybe six. Uh, strength sorry strength maybe six with one damage. Yeah. So then you have the three yeah. different damage profiles, and then terminators have the the mixture. They have some one damage, some two damage, some three damage, some guns. They're sort of your your mixed unit that's that's how i would try yeah. to separate them out just to make it so that each one has a distinct feel um right and then you know maybe their ability would be something like when they charge they do mortal wounds on the charge or something like that just to give right like the juggernaut lord don't have yeah that's that's how i would sort of separate them out i would also really yeah, i'd love to see that a, a chaos lord on foot oh uh, yes terminator armor we need something absolutely to, add to our terminators yep. And because they're just they don't like have like anything bloody surgeon or something like that would be kind of cool as well yeah like a like a uh yeah exactly like a what was a like blood a doctor basically doctor, yeah. yeah that would be awesome i think uh there was a lot of people talking about it um at least in like one of the one of the discords that i was in a lesser brass scorpion that would be cool yeah that would be very cool so or even but again like, it would you know, the one thing that I would absolutely love is if they gave World Eaters access to the Dreadclaw and the Charybdis. Because yes. in, the lore, in the lore, that's a massive thing for the World Eaters. Uh, and it would also give the World Eaters something, again, that can make them really distinct within the Chaos Space Marines range. Is you mm -hmm. have the Thousand Suns, they do all this psychic stuff. The Death Guard, they do all of this stuff. And then the World Eaters, they're all about, you know, rapid assault. You know, they, they drop in yep. and they do stuff. And then you could have a detachment... It's built around maybe getting plus one to charge if they arrive from reserves that turn. So you could have right. a det detachment that's themed around running that sort of play style. That would be really cool as well. So if GW... That'd be awesome. Do all of what we just said. <laughs> yeah, the, all those things would be yeah, yeah. great. Yeah, rewind this about yeah, two I mean... minutes. Get out your notepad. <laughs> get it done. Uh, thanks, Heath. I, I was a bit hand. disappointed... Um, is there anything else you want to talk about with the faction that your takeaways from the event? Because obviously uh, you've, you've performed exceptionally well. People are going to want to watch this. They're going to want to try to replicate that success. So was there any general sort of tips or any sort of general uh, learnings that you have yeah. from the world leaders? Yeah. Uh, don't throw away your units. We are an expensive elite army. If you don't think you can make a good trade, throw chaff. Throw the jackals at them. Throw your spawn at them. If you need to, throw your regular eight bound at them. Not your exalted. Yeah. Use wave systems. Continuously send waves. Yeah. Yeah, I think with the world is because we generally are going to have fewer units than our opponent because our units are so expensive. I think the trick is making sure that you don't overcommit too early unless that commitment is going to break their back. If you know going out to right. them, you're going to actually just break their back and they're not going to be able to respond, then absolutely do it. Absolutely, go for it, yeah. Yeah, but generally speaking, I think the play is to have a really passive first turn because if you go, mm -hmm. cool, in this turn, I'm going to kill three of your units, you're going to kill three of mine. The next turn, I'm going to kill three of yours, you're going to kill three of mine. You can only hold that up for two or three turns and then you're done. You're out of right. steam and they're yep. still going to have steam. So playing a cagey first couple of turns... And then going, all right, cool, now it's my time to come out and just go full psycho. That's that's my yeah. sort of general advice. Uh, it is interesting Absolutely. to see that I, it looks like that probably played out the same for the mech heavy world leaders as it does for the infantry heavy. It does, yep. So, yeah. All right, man. Well, thanks for coming on. Uh, do you Are you associated with any gaming clubs or podcasts or channels or any content creation uh, like that that you'd like to plug or...? I don't. I don't do any uh, content creating myself, but uh, I am part of the uh, the Red Path Discord. So if you want to check out the Red Path, uh, great bunch of guys, uh, gals, everything. They're it's a fantastic group. Yep. Yeah, I can absolutely vouch for that. They do some fantastic work. So yeah, definitely. I'll put a link in the description where people can join us over in the Red Path. 
thanks again for coming on, man. And uh, yeah, I'll talk to you if you achieve these results or something similar in the future. I'd love to pick your brain again right. so we can continue to share this with the uh, with the world leaders community at large. Sure thing. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. Alrighty, guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, like, subscribe, comment. Head over to blogfortheblood.com where you can show support for this channel by joining our Discord server. You can join our Patreon and get access to all kinds of premium content. You can get dice. You can get t-shirts like this to show your support. There's tons of ways that you can show your support for this channel so that I can make content like this more frequently and of higher quality. So with that being said, I'm going to end it here. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll send you in the next one. Cheers. Today's video is brought to you by Proxy Wars. Head over to their website if you want to show some support to those who support this channel.